Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Mal, you also had an exchange tour. Uh, can you tell us about this and how it came about? Yeah, this is a, it's a real story of making your own luck. So I'd always wanted to, to go on and, and do the Strike Eagle Exchange. And these, these programs exist. The, the RF has exchange programs with numerous air forces and, and other branches around the world. Uh, so there was, a, there was an F-111 exchange in Australia. There were exchanges in the States. I particularly wanted the Strike Eagle one. And how it works is that one, a, a Brit goes out to the States on exchange and an American comes to the UK as the other end of the exchange. So I, I was aware that it, it was sort of coming up to the time when the exchange tour would be boarded. Um, and so I, I, this was when I, I was a QY and I was on 15 squadron instructing at Lossie. And we'd gone down to the annual weapons instructors conference that the Air Warfare Centre ran at Waddington. And I ran into uh, an F3 pilot there who had just been told he was going on the Strike Eagle Exchange. I thought, oh, this is weird, because they're normally boarded at about the same time, the, the NAV and the pilot one. They normally switch them over at the same time. Mm -hmm. Strange. <laughs> uh, so I, at that lunchtime, I got on to, my, uh, to the poster, to my desk officer at RF Manning, Air Manning, and said, um, I hear the F3, the pilot exchange for the Strike Eagle's been boarded. What's happened to the, the, the NAV exchange? And he says, yeah, it probably is about time we looked at that. <laughs> Right, right. Next phone call I make is to my boss. Say, right, boss, it's been on my preference sheet anyway each year about the Strike Eagle Exchange. Can you put in a good word for me if that if that's doable? Uh, and now whether that made any difference or not, I don't know. But later on that year, the we had a wing aircrew lunch at Lossy Mouth, which is always a messy affair, and it had got particularly messy that year. <laughs> um, and the following morning, I was called to see the station commander. And I was just on the, on the squadron and somebody says to me, Mal, CO wants to see you. Oh. What do you mean, the squadron boss? No, station commander. Right. OK. Get in the car, drive across. Um, his, his PAs in the outer office. I said, is this um, hats on or hats off? Oh, very much hats on. Oh, right. Uh, station commander calls me in. I march in. Salute. What happened last night? So I'm afraid I honestly don't know. Are you telling me you have no recollection of what you got up to last night? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, it's not about that. Sit down, <laughs> take your hat off. I thought, oh, you bastard. <laughs> he says, um, I'm calling you in to let you know that you've been selected for the Strike Eagle Exchange. What? Wow, uh, fantastic, brilliant. He says, and, I'm, and I recommend you don't accept it. What? <laughs> He says, yeah, well, you're very close to promotion now to squadron leader. And if you, if you were picked for squadron leader when you were out there, it, it won't count as squadron leader time. It'll be dead time. So I'm getting promoted. Oh, there's no guarantee of that. <laughs> right, well, I think I'll take the Strike Eagle Exchange then, if that's all the same to you. He says, well, you should think carefully about it. I already have <laughs> for several years. Uh, so, so off I went. And he, he was right. I did get promoted out there, and the Air Force did count it as dead time because right. they're petty like that. But, but I do not regret a single minute of it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Was there much competition for that role? Yeah, yeah, lots of people wanted it. And I, like I say, I, I don't know if it was just timing that I, because I spotted the market opportunity, that put me at the front of the queue or, or what, but um, I was lucky enough to get selected for it. So we, we went out in, in March 2000, we went out to the States um, to, to start the exchange. It was based at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina, where there are four Strike Eagle squadrons, two are what they call the FTU, Formal Training Unit, 
Uh, that's the 333rd and 334th fighter squadrons, and then you've got the 335th and 336th, which are the two op squadrons at Seymour. And there was also a, a KC-135 tanky unit there as well. Mm -hmm. And a federal prison and all sorts of other things. Um, <laughs> And the exchange at that time, both the pilot and the nav exchanges were on the, the formal training units, one on each squadron. So that was the expectation that we would go out and, and fly on the, on the FTU. Um, so we got out there in the march and the first thing they do, they fly you into, as a family, they fly you into Washington DC and you spend the weekend in DC just doing a bit of acclimatization. On the Monday, there's briefings to attend at the embassy. Then they fly you up to, where are you going? North Carolina for us. Raleigh Durham Airport, and you go off and, and start getting your domestic life sorted out because um, you've only got this, this two week window to sort everything out before you then start the course. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we were able to take over the house of the F3 pilot who was just leaving the exchange okay. um, because they'd overlapped, the two F3 pilots had overlapped. So, whilst one got productive, the other was still out, out there. So he was leaving about the same time as we arrived, so we were able to take their house over, which simplified things a little bit. But in, in the way of things, they managed, the, the military managed to complicate that two-week period, so it's not just a settling in period. I had to go all the way to New Mexico to Holloman Air Force Base to do the centrifuge. Okay. Uh, I then had to go to Shore Air Force Base in South Carolina to do a refresher aeromedical training. And all the, in the middle of this, you're trying to get social security numbers, driving licenses, bank accounts, move your, your stuff in. Um, I, I rang the shipping company actually to say, any idea where our stuff is? And the, the guy tapping the keyboards. Yeah, let me see. In fact, your, your belongings left Liverpool on the Atlantic conveyor on such and such a date and they should be in Baltimore any time now. Hang on a minute, mate. The Atlantic conveyor sank in the Falklands War. Oh no, this is, this is Atlantic conveyor three. <laughs> Okay, what happened to two? Well, that sank as well, right? Uh, <laughs> are, are my things safe? Uh, so we eventually we get all the stuff and get onto the point where I'm allowed to start doing my flying training. Yeah, before we get into that, actually, I just uh, quickly ask, why didn't you fancy go for the F-111? I know similar to the Tornado Swing Wing, or did you just always want the Eagle? I just wanted the the newest, most capable jet. Right. Yeah. So it was yeah, the F-15 was the one I'd, I'd always had my eye on. Mm -hmm. So when you arrived, did you actually feel welcome? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The, uh, it, it's the same, I mean, with, with the reciprocal exchanges as well. You know that, that the person coming in is going to be a bit of a fish out of water in terms of mm -hmm. living in another country and, and getting it settled in, but they, they couldn't have been more welcoming, the Americans. It was, they, yeah, they were, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like that two-week uh, period where you were getting everything sorted, was that just basically up to you and your you know, partner or wife at the time, or did they get help from the military? you get almost no help. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an absolutely farcical process. Um, and an example of that is we were trying to get a mobile phone and we'd gone to several places to try and get them on contract and for whatever reason, we kept failing credit checks. So well, this is absurd. I, I had a, an, a letter from the embassy that said, this person is an exchange officer on tour with the US Air Force and uh, the embassy will underwrite any issues with credit ratings because they, you, you, you're starting up in a new country and they understand there are problems with it. But this just that that wasn't holding any water, and we, so we were really struggling to get a, a phone. And we we were in Radio Shack in Goldsboro outside Seymour Johnson, where the manager turns out to be a Scot, okay, married to an American, and. So we're chatting to him, and he says, "So what? I don't understand what the problem is then. If you've got this letter and you've got whatever," and he says. When did you, have you got social security numbers? He said, yeah, we've got those. They were issued a couple of days ago. That's your problem. Beg your pardon. He said, yeah, the system assumes that any social security number issued in the last, I think it was like five years, uh, is, has been issued to somebody, to, to an adult, means it's likely that you're in the Federal Witness Protection Programme. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so that explained why we've been having, having issues with these credit checks. But uh, anyway, he sorted us out with the phone and we were fine. So yeah, let's talk about the Eagle. Can you talk us through some of your ground training and how it started and the similarities and the differences coming from the REF or even the Tornado, for instance? Yeah, I mean, very, very similar in, in theory that you, you do exactly, you know, it's building block approach, you do ground school, then you do, uh, I suppose the, the difference with the Tornado was that 
the, the F-15 it had very good um, ground procedures trainers. So you had like cockpit mock-ups where you could learn switch selections and the like before you then get into the simulator, which, I mean, the sim in fairness was very similar to the Tornado sim in that it was more of a procedures trainer. You know, it's a blacked out cockpit. You're not, you're not working in a sort of 3D world. Um, but the, the, the process was, was very similar. So you do blocks of ground school, do sims, go and fly those sorties in the air. And the sorties were done on a, they did, you'd do a sea ride and a do ride, as they called it. So you would do one where you were flying that, you'd done it in the simulator, you go and fly it in the air, get used to whatever the new procedures were. And then your do ride would be doing the, the sortie again, but now you're being assessed on certain specific things. Um, they called it Demo Pro. On each sortie, there were certain things that you had to demonstrate proficiency in. So your do ride, you had to Demo Pro on X, Y, Z procedures or, or whatever. And one of the sorties was actually phenomenally simple for me. The only thing I had to Demo Pro on on this sortie was chaff and flare use. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, I only remember this sortie clearly because just at the point we we're about to approach our brake turn, it was an air combat sortie, about to approach the brake turn, I thought, right, I need to be sure, certain I get the chaff and flares out on time here. I looked down to make sure I'd got the right selection <laughs> as we went into a 9G brake turn. Uh, <laughs> chaff and flaring to make sure that, that I'm not failing the sortie. Eventually managed to struggle to get my head back above the, the parapet and see out the cockpit. But the, yeah, so it's, you know, in theory, it's, the setup is very similar. It was, the training was longer. Um, I did about, I think about 60 hours on the transition course and then about another 60 hours on the instructor course. Um, largely because it's just that this sea ride, do ride, sea ride, do ride. And that builds up a lot of the hours. Um, but the, I did the, the, I think it was the last ever transition course, which was a course for, so they had basic courses, which were long. And the transition course was for people coming to the F-15 from other jets. Right. So folks on my course, there was a guy who transitioned from, to the Air Force from the Navy. He'd flown F-14s. Uh, with a guy off F-111s. Um, I was crewed with a lady called Katie who'd come from the F-15C. She'd been flying that out in Japan, Kadena. Um, and so it was a real good spread of experience on the course. So that was great. So the, those with air-to-ground experience could help the air-to-air -air folks and vice versa. Um, and I couldn't ask to be crew with a better pilot. She was great. So so we got through, got through that, and then I then went on to the um, so that was on the three thirty fourth fighter squadron, the, the Eagles. I then went on to the three thirty third, the Lancers, to do my instructor course because we try as we'd been trying desperately to get the the, the exchanges moved on to the operational squadrons. Mm -hmm but it hadn't happened in time for me. So I was going to go to the training squadron. The pilot was on the other training squadron. Um, our replacements, we managed to get both to the op squadrons. Oh, nice. And that's where they, those exchanges stayed. But so for me, I was on the, on the training squadron. So I had to go through their instructor course, uh, which again was uh, say about another 60 hours learning. So it, all the sorties that I'd just been through on the transition course, but learning how to teach those <laughs> with all of my 60 hours experience on the jet, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then at the end of all that, you come out as a, as a qualified instructor. Yeah. Did it feel like a leap forward from the GR1? Yeah, in many ways. The, one, of the, one of the things that always held the tornado back was this, this sort of penny pinching in the UK military that, so we came back from the Gulf War, we'd been using tiles, uh, and suddenly there were no tile pods so you, you didn't have tile pods right. to train with. And that this was a constant thread in the Air Force that you never had the equipment to train with properly. Yeah. And particularly with targeting pods, we never bought enough targeting pods. So the only time you really ever saw them, you might get one occasionally uh, on a workup sortie for an operational deployment. But most of the time you'd arrive on ops, you'd train with it in the sin, you'd arrive on ops and that's your that. first time using the equipment, you know? And with the Strike Eagle, it was, it was sat there on the flight line every day as a fully combat ready aircraft. So it, it had the lantern pods on it. This was the uh, low altitude navigation targeting infrared for night system. A pod on either side. On the one side, uh, it was a, a targeting pod. And I think that side also had the infrared camera. And on the other side, it was a, a terrain following radar pod. Um, so you 
any day, it was a rare day you went flying in the Strike Eagle and you couldn't do whatever you wanted on that sortie because the aircraft was just, it had everything on it. Ready to go. And all the software was there, you know, the, the training squadrons had the same squad software as the op squadrons, which wasn't always the case in the UK. And so that, I think the big difference was, was that and the fact that you're flying a much more modern aircraft. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the Strike Eagle saw its debut in Desert Storm. The Tornado wasn't an old aircraft at that point, but in comparison, it looked it. Yeah. And you know, so now I've got an aircraft with real powerful engines, more or less a glass cockpit, not fully, but uh, in the Tornado where I was sat as a navigator, the air intakes are sort of out in front of you here, mm -hmm. so you can't get a good view of the ground and in the F-15 you're in this big bubble canopy. Mm -hmm. You feel, I mean, I felt kind of naked in it, in a way. Yes, in, the, in, the the in the tornado, almost, yeah. I mean, if, I, if I'd gone to war in it, I'd have noticed a real difference because in the tornado, say all that AAA flashing up at you, but you, you kind of feel like you've got some ironwork around you. you. You didn't feel like that at all in the Strike Eagle. Yeah. And say so, so you, you had a um, a really good synthetic aperture radar that, that for ground mapping and like. So there were there were some significant differences. Mm. Um, but it, it still, you know, it was a real learning curve to, to fly the jet because you're learning another nation's procedures. I had to learn the air-to-air -air role to a point where I'm competent to teach it. Yeah. And so for the, you know, probably the first year on the aircraft, I still felt like I was, you know, barely keeping my head above water. <laughs> um, but yeah, then you get into the groove a bit more. So can you remember your first flight and could you feel a power difference coming from the tornado? Because obviously you said the, the big end. Yeah, definitely. And, and not least because on your first flight, you do an unrestricted takeoff. So, you know, take off, gear up, but keep the nose down, down the runway and then pull the nose up and up you go to 10,000 feet and then pull over and, and recover. I mean, in the tornado, you just fall out of the sky. <laughs> but so, you, you know, that's your first experience of the jet is this... All right, so there's some power here. I can imagine, um, yeah. In fact, the second sortie is probably more memorable than the first. That that first sortie, you just sort of do a local area for mill, get used to being in the aeroplane, starting it up, shutting it down, kind of stuff, and, and go and see some of the diversion bases. The second sortie was similar, but you're you know now you're starting to have to demonstrate proficiency on things. But uh, I was flying with the Brit pilot oh, okay. that, that day, and and he said, right, one thing I do need to do. The squadron's about to go into BFM, basic fighter manoeuvres. I just need to brush up on my uh, brake turns, my 9G brake turns. So the aircraft is cleared to 9G. You're expected to pull as close to 9G as possible on the brake turns, but not over that. So we go off and practice a brake turn, and his first brake turn, 9.4G. The aircraft gives you a warning. It's over G, over G. Oh no. So we, got, we sent the two Brits off together and we've broken the aeroplane. <laughs> uh, but there's, you, you can call a display up on the screen and it tells you uh, whether you've over G'd any of the mass items or not. And if you haven't, it's not a big problem. They just do it. There's a cursory inspection. If you've over G'd any of the mass items, that's, that's structural problem, potential structural right. problems with the aircraft. We hadn't, luckily. So, but it's taken the jet back, you know. Tail between your legs. Yeah, uh, yeah the two Brits broke the aeroplane. Uh, what did he fly, uh, the Brit guy? F3. F3. Yeah. Good lad. So he wasn't used to flying a performance fighter. <laughs> so can you talk us through some of the flying training on the Eagle? And um, yeah, what kind of, was it mainly, was it like 50-50 air to ground uh, and air to air? You're quite quickly into the air to air stuff, actually. So you, in fact, you, you do that more or less, first of all, you, you learn the air to air stuff before the air to ground and then bring right. it all together at the end. So you go off and you do, initially you do a lot of, well, you do some transition flights, which is where you learn to, to fly the aeroplane and the pilots have to do, you know, instrument rating tests mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, then, you, then you get into basic 1v1 fighter, uh, basic fighter maneuvers. You build that up. Then you get into air combat maneuvering, 2v1, 2v2 stuff. Then you're into longer range intercepts using the, the, um, as, uh, the AMRAM, and then you go into air to ground, you start to learn how to use the aircraft in the air to ground role, then you bring it all together at the end in what they call SAT, surface to air tactics. So you're, you're flying the aircraft on an air to ground mission, but most of the time you're using the air to air, the radar in its air to air mode, and you'll have you know, fighters to fight, fight through on your way to the target and the like. So that so actually by the end of the trans, uh, by the end of the, the course, the basic course students new to the aircraft have a really good handle on 
on flying the aircraft in all regimes of flight, right. um, in all the roles. And one thing that was really good about the, the transition onto the Strike Eagle for the, for the new kids and for, for us on the transition course as well, was you'd get to drop some, some proper bombs, not live bombs, but we got to drop um, a GB-12 on one of the training sorties, a 500 pound LGB, and on one sortie flying with KT, we got 12 500 pounders to drop at the range, uh, 12 BDU-50s. And I was desperate to drop them all in a one I dropped a salvo of eight from a tornado, but but I never in my life was I again going to get the opportunity to drop twelve in a in a, in a one. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't let us. They said no, oh. no, you've got to you know we need to do different attack profiles, get a couple of bombs off each time. I was like, oh, I'm crushed. Come on, <laughs> please. And they wouldn't let us. But that that was a really good aspect of the training was that the the students by the end of it have have genuinely flown the aircraft heavyweight. In fact, one of the photos I sent you um, was of a one of the SAT courses, SAT sorties at the end of a basic course where we were taking six Strike Eagles, each loaded with six 500 pounders inert. Um, we, we tanked on a KC-135 on the way out. Our target was on a thing called a place called Hardwood Range up in uh, Michigan or Wisconsin, I think in Wisconsin. We flew against some Air National Guard F-16s on the way in, dropped the bombs, back to the tanker on the way out, back home, you know, long sortie with, with six 500 pounders on. So for, the, for the, you know, the young folk transitioning onto the jet for the first time, never flown anything bigger than a, you know, a, a T-55, whatever, not T-55, T-38, T-38 sorry, yeah. Um, that step from when they first flew the aircraft to now what they've jump. just done, a proper, you know, sort of reflective war sortie mm-hmm. was really good training. Mm-hmm. The other thing actually that's worth mentioning is that most of the sim instructors on the Strike Eagle, um, they were all ex-military and most of them were Vietnam vets. Oh, okay. So there was some incredible experience sitting in that simulator. Some of them had flown the Strike Eagle, a lot of them had flown F4s, some of them had flown, you know, a a1s and all sorts in Vietnam. It's a huge experience to, to tap into, which was really helpful. Absolutely. And uh, we have to talk about DACT. How did the Strike Eagle fare and what kind of aircraft did you go up against? Um, uh, did quite a bit against F-16s in my time out there. Uh, occasionally F-18s because the, the, you know, the US Navy has quite a few bases down the East mm-hmm. Coast as well. So we would occasionally do support for each other. Um, and to be honest, it, the Strike Eagle is a big aeroplane. Mm-hmm. It can turn, but it, you know you're not going to outmatch an F-16 or or even an F-18 most of the time. Um, the advantage you do have with the Strike Eagle is you can get high and fast. And so, if you're in a, in a BVR fight, throwing Amrams, you can usually out outrange most people with the Amram. Mm-hmm. And there were a few other things that the Strike Eagle t- could do, which I'm. I, probably can't talk about that that gave you a, a bit of an edge there as well but once you got into the close in fight which you always did yeah. because it's that's part of the training they yeah they kick your butt <laughs> I mean, we did um, a few deployments where we spent two weeks at luke air force base for a while um which we'd gone across to help one of their ftu squadrons and we've just read air for two weeks so providing dissimilar air combat when they went through their 1v1s 1v2s 2v2 phase and and that was a great experience. So I got to fly the F-16 sim. I didn't get a sortie, unfortunately. Um, but we did a lot of flying against the F-16s there. And it, it was, as I said, you know, if you if you can find them on radar, because that's a little aeroplane, yeah. <laughs> then BVR, you've, you've got an advantage. But in the close-in fight, you haven't got hope in hell. <laughs> uh, but uh, all great experience. Um, but my lasting memory of it is that Luke Air Force Base was like, it was like an Air Force only in miniature. Because the F-16's a small aeroplane, they were driving these little vans around the flight line, and compared to the Strike Eagle, everything looked tiny. It looked like they'd, they'd like taken an Air Force and shrunk it. Mm-hmm. And we, there was um, a Gripen came through one day. We were there as well, so we were out. We were out in the arming area waiting to go flying, and a, and a Gripen was I don't know what, what it was doing, um, but pulled up alongside us waiting to get airborne. And I, I swear you could almost have taxied it underneath the wing of the Strike Eagle. It's tiny. I, I really didn't have an appreciation how small that aircraft was until then. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> but we'd also do, I mean, we spent a couple of weeks at Nellis at one point as well doing support for the weapons school over there. 
Um, so we're flying with any of the aircraft that we're doing that we're going through weapons school at that time. We did some F-15 sorties, F-16. Um, I can't remember who else we flew with, but it's, it's some some really interesting sorties. So can you talk us through some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Strike Eagle? Yeah, actually, this goes back to a question you asked earlier about what did other nations think about the tornado. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, so even though you're there as an exchange officer, there are some things that are still considered no foreign, no, no foreign national access. And one of those was a, a, a large portion of their tactics manual. But weirdly, one part of the tactics manual that wasn't considered no foreign was the bit that talked about strengths and weaknesses of other NATO aircraft. And I, so I read through this for the tornado and everything they had this as a weakness, I would have had as a strength. <laughs> but then if you, that was just a, a bizarre little aside. Um, thinking about the, the F-15 and the tornado in comparison, in most places the F-15 had the edge, but one thing that the tornado really had over the Strike Eagle was its night low level performance. The TFR in the tornado was absolutely superb. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty much fail safe. The only, the only times it's ever, giving people problems is when the crew haven't um, engaged it correctly in the tornado. In the Strike Eagle, because it was a potted system and part of the lantern, it never felt as robust. And it, it didn't have the turn capability that the tornado did at, at night at low level. So, so that, that was a weakness. But in most other respects, the Strike Eagle had the edge, not least in power and weapons carriage capability. And you know, you've got the conformal fuel tanks, which had the extra, the, the racks on there. Um, the only thing I, I ever felt I missed in the Strike Eagle from the Tornado was that the Tornado has a dedicated radar warning receiver display. Mm. On the Strike Eagle, you've got to call it up on one of the multifunction displays. Okay. Now, you wouldn't think that was an issue because you've got four multifunction displays, two, two big ones in the centre and two slightly smaller ones either side. Mm. Uh, so you think, well, you've only got one pair of eyes, but you're constantly scanning. So... To, and there were other things you wanted on those displays. Mm -hmm. you know, radar, sit display, weapons layout, the route uh, information, whatever it might be. I always felt I wanted a fifth display just so that I could have the radar warning receiver. That It was called the TUSE in the Strike or Tactical Electronic Warfare uh, System. I always felt I wanted that on permanently because I was used to that in the Tornado. Yeah, so that's the one thing that I just kind of felt, uh, this is... Something's missing. Yeah, I just want that one thing and then we do there. So I've heard that the US Air Force are quite strict on flying rules. Is that true compared to the RAF? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's a lot stricter. They, they probably have more rules, mm -hmm. so it, it probably feels stricter. Um, and certainly you notice the difference if you've been flying with the USAF and then you fly with the US Navy. The US Navy approach to flying is much more attuned with the RAF way of doing things. Having said that, you, you most of the guys, no, a large proportion of the guys that I flew with at, at Seymour on the Strike Eagle had spent time at Lake and Heath, on the, oh, uh, either yeah. on the Eagle or, or in the UK on other aircraft. So they were very attuned to the UK way of life and to, to being around Brits. So I, as you noticed it too much. The one, the one time I really noticed it, and I, I don't know why I hadn't picked up on it when we were doing the simulators, prior to this, but on the, so when I was transitioning onto the Strike Eagle, the first time we went to the bombing range, we were running into the range and in the tornado, you bomb at 150 feet on the range or did back then. Um, so running into the range, you would set the rad out bug to 10% below your min set clearance height. So for 150 foot bombing, you set the, the rad out to 135 feet. We're running into the range in the States and all their low flying is at 500 feet. So we're going through the, the range checks and the, the checks, one of the checks is set the run out bug to the height, to, you know, 10% below set minimum set clearance height. So I was running out, I said, right, uh, setting the bug to 135. Hmm. Why are you doing that? And this is the first time it dawned on me, oh, you're kidding me, we're not bombing at 500 feet, are we? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Kill me now. And that, that was the, the one time I really noticed the difference between the two forces. Oh, why are we doing this? This isn't realistic. <laughs> so how did you find flying with their US Air Force pilots? Great, great. I, I, I had a whale of a time with them. I mean, they, you know, as I said, a lot of them have been in the UK. They, I think they quite appreciated the fact that the US Air Force is, or was then, quite a, um, had quite a, a strict PC kind of culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not saying that the RF was was 
running a mock or anything, but they would they kind of appreciated that they could be a little bit less careful around a Brit than they had to be around an, another oh, American. Right. Okay. Uh, so I think I think that was the biggest difference. But no, you, you would have a great time with them. Yeah, there was so much yeah. banter there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> both yeah. sides, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that went, went both ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So did you actually uh, socialise quite a lot with the squad, or did you just do your own thing? No, you, you socialise a lot with them. Yeah, because you, you're you know, you're adrift in in a foreign community. They might speak more or less the same language, but there's there's a lot of differences and and. You look on a map, and North Carolina is halfway down the east coast, but it's the south. Yeah. It's very much south of America. So um, we're not religious. A lot of the locals are down yeah. there. Um, so that you know, it could feel very, very alien. Everyone was very friendly, but you know, you're, you're very aware that it's a different culture. So you were like aware more of, of a different culture than you would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so yeah, no, there was a lot of socialising with, there were, so there were other exchange officers at Seymour, there were four exchange officers, the two Brits, a pilot and a nav, there was an Aussie pilot and there was a, um, a German Air Force nav as well. Right. So you did a lot of your socialising, you know, the, the exchange officers were a sort of group unto themselves, but you would socialise on the squadrons as well. And the squadron did quite a lot of, of social activities and, and the like anyway. Um, and in fact, we would have a Battle of Britain cocktail party every year, which we oh, organised cool. in, in the O Club. And the f- uh, first year there, I, I was, I'd just missed that. So the next year round, I'm the new boy, Mal, you're organising the Battle of Britain cocktail party. All right, fantastic. Um, and the, the German nav came up to me and said, Mal, would you mind if we co-organise this with you or we get some, some funding I think I can get some funding from the from the German embassy oh, wow. to do this with you and I said that would be absolutely fantastic mate because it's you know it's it's a you're commemorating the lives lost it doesn't matter that you know we're allies now it, it, they were all lives lost so so the Germans co-funded the Battle of Britain cocktail party that year with us, which, I, which I thought was fantastic and we did it as as like a split event there was a sort of formal aspect to it a a cocktail party, if you like, in the afternoon with in your best uniforms, with the wing leadership, and we had folks down from all the embassies. Was that the sensible uh, bit? <laughs> that was the sensible bit. And then once that had finished, right, changed back into flying suits. We'd already, the night before, we decorated the bar in the O Club, themed it out like an English pub. And so there was then a flight suit party in the O Club, culminating, of course, in a burning of a piano outside. Of course. <laughs> um, so we'd managed to source a piano from somewhere. I'd had to sweet talk the fire section and explain what was going to be done. They said, yes, we could do that as long as we're there. We need to be there for fire cover. So I said, all right, well, we'll let you know when it's about to happen. And so they, they came down with the fire crew and people got rides in the fire engine and everything. And it went off really well. Um, the, uh, about two or three weeks afterwards, the O Club manager tracked me down and, and said, um, we be doing another of these Battle of Britain cocktail parties next year. He said, yeah, we'd, we'll be doing it every year. I mean, that's, that's the basic plan. He said, right, it's just about the piano burning. Uh, was, it, was it a problem? He said, no, no, no. I've managed to get hold of one for you here next year. Said, oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I was going to be in trouble, but there she was. She'd, she'd managed to track one down already for us to use the following year. She'd been rare. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like you, when you said you got back in your flying suits, would you wear a tornado patch or were you all like eagled up? No, uh, strike eagle patches. Right. Yeah, so you, you, you're just fitting in as a, as a member of, of the squadron. Um, the one concession to that, so on a, on a Friday, you would wear Friday patches. Um, so that each squadron had the, the proper patches to wear during the week. Friday was a bit more relaxed, so yeah. they would have a, a, you know, different squadron patches they would wear on that day. And at the time, um, so I'd gone out there as a, as a Tornado Qualified Weapons Instructor. The, the RAF didn't have QI badges back then, mm-hmm. but the USAF have their Fighter Weapons School badges. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they went and made me up some unofficial, what looked like USAF Weapons School badges, but with... RAF weapons instructor That's on them, so I would, I would usually wear my my uh, RAF badge on a Friday afternoon. Sometimes one or two people would occasionally get upset about that. So you haven't done the weapons, the, the USAF weapons course. Yeah. A, it doesn't say I have, and B, <laughs> I didn't buy it. The this, the USAF bought it for me. So <laughs> yeah, but no, you were you were badged up as a member of the squadron. Yeah. So can you share any memorable stories from your time flying the Strike Eagle? Um, well, that, that 
sort of I talk, talked about where we went across to Wisconsin and the, the photos, you know, actually it's, I think it's Lake Erie in the, um, in the background underneath the, the KC-135. It's a frozen landscape and the, the Great Lakes there in the background. That, that was a brilliant sortie to fly on. Um, the other one that springs to mind actually was when we were doing the weapon school support at Nellis for two weeks. Uh, and I was flying with, with Simo, the Aussie exchange pilot at the time while we were out there because some of what the weapons school were doing was considered no fawn. So they thought it's easier to fly crew us two together so that if it was a no fawn sortie, they, we didn't have to start messing around with crews. We just weren't flying on that sortie. We'd been in something else. But we did, we did a couple of really interesting sorties. One was doing um, ABFAC with an F-16 crew who were doing the F-16 weapons course. So we were out on the ranges and they're talking us onto targets while we're dropping 500 pounders, I think, probably. Uh, and then another one where we did a time-sensitive targeting one. And this one was particularly fascinating for, for me and for Simo because the whole time, every time you've done a red flag, the big container and the small container, Area 51 and Tonopah were off limits. Even though Tonopah was much less sensitive now, it was still considered off limits and it was, it was a day on the naughty step if you, if you encroached on that. Well, the sortie that Simo and I flew on one day of the weapons school support was actually in Tony Park test range. So th that was the first big thing. Like, oh, sure we're allowed in there. Uh, but it, it was a time sensitive targeting sortie where they were also using camouflage, concealment and deception. So we were trying to get in below, I think it might have been an SA-20 threat or certainly a high range Soviet SAM threat at low level to then prosecute this, try and find, um, I think it was a, supposed to be a scud launcher or something, but which had been concealed. So we knew roughly where it was, but it, they'd done everything they could to hide the thing. Um, and my lasting memory of that, that sortie was just that at one point in that sortie, we were, we were supersonic at low level in Tony Parr test range mm -hmm. as two foreign nationals. And this, this was, we were commenting on it at the time, right? It really feels like we shouldn't be doing this, but it was, all, it was all above board and there we were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So how many hours did you get on this Great Eagle? I didn't get all that many actually in the end. It, for, I was out there for three years. Yeah. Um, I was out there when 9-11 happened. In fact, I was briefing for a sortie that day, uh, which got cancelled clearly, but we were, so somebody came into the, to the briefing room and said, I think you guys aren't gonna be flying today, but you might wanna come and look at this. And so we, we came out of the briefing room and there was one of the towers already on fire mm. and at that point was the moment where the plane flew in and hit the second tower so we were watching that live on television all right this is going to change a few things yeah and it and it, it did in as much as it really impacted my flying for the next yeah imagine. short while because yeah. all of the well nearly all the routine training flying stopped and all the squadrons were re-rolled into air defense and they were legal going so whenever whenever there was anything going on like a um, NFL match or uh, you know any, any big sporting event even you would have an, a combat air patrol up over it and the the Brits weren't allowed to fly on that mm. the we were keen to and the Americans were keen to have us but the embassy said no not happening if if can you imagine a Brit shooting down an airliner over mm. America mm. we're not accepting that so that that meant a lot of the flying that I could have, you know, I would have got a lot of hours if I'd been flying those sorties, mm -hmm. but that all went to other people. Um, so in the end, I think I got about 330 hours. Not bad still. Yeah, it just wasn't as much as I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah. So Madeline, you went back to the UK and you flew the GR4. What was this like and what were the improvements from the GR1? Uh, one of the best things about going back to fly the GR4 was that most of the teething problems had been ironed out. So it had come into service while I was away. And so I didn't, didn't have to go through much of the pain of, the, of getting, it was effectively not quite a new jet, but not far off. Um, but the big differences that you noticed, uh, it, the forward looking infrared was a big part of it. So that was built into the aircraft now. And you had it on a repeater display in the, in the rear cockpit. So it was primarily for the pilot's HUD, but you could see it in the back cockpit as well, which was oh, great. Okay. 
you, the aircraft was, was properly integrated for night vision goggles, so we, we got into MVG training. So I'd done my MVG call on the Strike Eagle, but the Tornado hadn't really been using MVGs before I went away, so that, that was really noticeable. And then the other thing was the, the weapons data bus that had been put in as part of the upgrade, uh, which meant that you could now simulate a wider array of weapons, you could carry more stuff. Um, so we then that's when we started getting into brimstone started coming into service and so you could you were starting to get the smart weapons and be able to use those where i saw the big benefit of that was i was my flight commander role was running the qy course and we were able to take the qy courses out to the states to do exercise torpedo focus live bombing so we did it back to back so one course that was finishing one course that was starting two weeks each so i did four weeks at luke air force base of of um, not all live, but heavyweight weapon bombing, Paveway 2, e Paveway 2, Paveway 3, 1,000 pounders, HE strafe, all of that. Um, and, and you could, you know, you start to get the sense that the Tornado had really found its feet now with mm -hmm. the midlife upgrade and the, and the GL4 capabilities. Mm -hmm. So overall, did you enjoy your flying career? Loved it. Loved it. Absolutely. I think everyone would say the same thing. You know, you, you go off and you do ground tours and they're like a necessary evil, but you do as little of that as possible. And, and when you leave, you don't miss the ground tours. No. <laughs> it's, the, it's the flying you miss and Absolutely. the people that you're flying with. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've got a couple of personal questions to wrap up here, Mal. So do you have any hobbies? Yeah, cycling is my, my big hobby. Um, I, I did a lot last year, particularly because I was doing a 30th anniversary of the Gulf War fundraising bike ride last year. Um, but yeah, cycling's the big one. I do volunteering down here at Solway Aviation Museum as well, just to keep that little bit of Air Force feel to things. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Favourite aircraft you have flown? Lancaster. Oh, you flew the Lancaster? Yeah, I was lucky really? enough when, so between coming back from the States and going back onto the Tornado, I, I did, uh, no, sorry, I've got my timing wrong. When I was, uh, I'd finished flying the Tornado, I did a tour as the boss of the, uh, I ran the Air Warfare School. And one of my instructors, Nav, who ran the electronic warfare training, was also on BBMF, flying the, the bombers. And because he would get a lot of time away in the summer to go and do the BBMF flying, they like to give you a bit of quid quo quo, mm -hmm. quid pro quo, sorry. So I got to go and, and do a, uh, one of the display flights in the Lancaster one weekend, which was absolutely fantastic. That's and amazing. Yeah, I flew the, the Tornado and the Strike Eagle, both lovely aeroplanes, but the <laughs> Lancaster. Lancaster all the way. One you like to fly, either past or present? Um, I'd love to have flown some of the Second World War stuff. Uh, I, mean, I was lucky enough to get a go in, a, in, the, in the Lancaster, but what, I mean, what those bomber crews did in the war was fantastic. Um, maybe the Spitfire, maybe the P-51 would have been lovely to fly in, but I mean, just flying the Lancaster, I think, was the, was the pinnacle for me. I, did get, I flew a couple of sorties in an Alpha jet way back during the training. Okay. Um, I managed to blag, that was good fun. Uh, yeah, so, so some of the Second World War stuff would have been nice to fly in. Nice. Well, one from our patrons here. Um, which did you prefer, um, the American flying gear or the RAF? Um, I suppose the, the, the only real difference between any of it was it, in the Strike Eagle you, you wore what they call Combat Edge, which is not only a G-suit but a G-jacket. That made a difference, not least it made you really hot. Um, but their flying helmet was much lighter than ours. Mm -hmm. You barely noticed putting it on. So that I probably uh, their helmet had an edge over ours, I would say. But the rest of it was all very similar. Right. And can we find you online anywhere? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at, at Mal Craghill. Um, I, there's not a lot of aviation on there, uh, unfortunately. But, um, but that's that's where people can find me. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Well, Mal, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>